Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to the Terrace Movement, Inc. 11th Annual Workshop on Geoethical Nanotechnology on this fine uh, Wednesday, which happens to be the 47th anniversary of the first lunar launch. Prior to beginning the workshop, please allow me just a few minutes to go over some uh, helpful tips and hints. Uh, only the presenter will be advancing the slides on these presentation screens at the at the head of the uh, conference room. Unless you are the presenter, please do not engage your speaker or your voice chat control during the workshop. A Q&A session will follow the presentation. Questions are limited to the text box found in the lower left toolbar. The presenter will address only those questions appearing within the chat history box. A moderator may assist to ensure that all questions are addressed by the presenter. Uh, if you are the presenter, make certain that your cell phone or other signal emitting devices are either turned off or sufficiently away from your computer during the time that you're speaking or the time that your microphone is engaged. Failing to do so may interfere with your audio. It may cause uh, a static or a reverberation. Well, with that said, I would like to wish everyone a wonderful workshop experience and move on to our convening presentation, which I will be giving. Now, some of you may be wondering why, uh, what geoethical nanotechnology is and uh, why host this workshop on the anniversary of the first lunar landing? How does this tie in with uh, biological or mechanical cell repair? Well, geoethics, as defined by Martine Rothblatt, founder of TerraSEM, is the study of technology risk management across geographic spaces. The purpose of, of holding, uh, creating, and hosting this workshop is to create a a geoethical and earth-friendly and safe harbor for nanotechnology, um, a safe harbor uniting science and technology. Now, we host this workshop on the anniversary of the first lunar launch or first lunar landing, Space Day, because nothing within the last uh, 100 years better exemplifies the ability for people to take something said to be so impossible, like, like space flight, and make it possible, and to have done so quickly uh, from the goal to reality in less than 10 years. And it's, and it's all guided by cooperation um, with due regard for others, which falls well into the, um, the risk benefit management that we were talking about across the uh, geographic spaces. Now, geoethics is an evolving concept that treats the planet or a planet as a patient. Healing the planet, but first do no harm. Uh, per uh, Eric Drexler's Engines of Creation, published in 1986, nanotechnology is the precision building of something, atom by atom, molecule by molecule. Hence tying in uh, the theme of this workshop in, into um, biological and mechanical cell repair. Um, move on a little bit. Um, <clears throat> now, the terrorism movement believes that nanotechnology will be one of evolution's primary vectors for improving human uh, human condition and, and disseminating humanity universally. Uh, with this, with his activation of energy. Uh, Teilhard de Jardin, who was a Jesuit priest and scientist, is quoted, we might say at this moment, as in the time of Galileo, what we most urgently need in order to appreciate the convergence of the universe is much less new facts than a new way of looking at the facts and accepting them, a new way of seeing combined with a new way of action. That is what we need. Geoethics is a key mission of TerraSAM. As diversity demands integration with nanotechnology, unity requires an agreement amongst those who may be adversely affected by the risks, and joyful and continued existence requires that the ratio of benefit to adverse uses of technology be maximized. Hence, again, also tying in um, 
biological and or mechanical cell repair. And, and I thank you. Now, um, uh, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, founder of the Institute for Blockchain Studies and a theorist from the Department of Philosophy and Economic Theory at the New School of Social Research in New York City. Please let's welcome Melanie Swan. And I will advance you to your first slide. And Melanie, if thank you. If you need assistance in advancing the slides, just say next slide and I'll give you, I'll give you a hand. I'm just uh, approaching the podium. Is my audio working for everybody? Yes, working fine. Okay, perfect. So I'm just honing my video controls and I'll begin. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Lori, for the possibility of participating in this workshop. I am a big supporter of the moon landing. It's very exciting to be speaking on the day that's the anniversary of the moon landing. And my talk uh, is the slides are available online at slideshare.net forward slash Loblaga. The talk uh, title is Bio Crypto Economy, the Philosophy of Biological Cell Repair Informing Geoethical Nanotechnology. So the agenda is to introduce the topic of, uh, and then look at biological cell repair, the philosophy of biological cell repair, um, top nine nanotechnology uh, repair advances. Let's see, just zooming in on the um, presentation again. Um, I'm sorry, is there a way that I can see the slides without the arrows? Uh, not at this time. Um, okay. If you wanted to look at the larger board and walk around in front, I can advance the slides for you. Just say next slide, please. Let's see. Okay, that might, that might work better. Um, sure. So, um, so the, the first I'll give the introduction and then a bio, talk about biological cell repair, the philosophy of biological cell repair, top nine nanotechnology cell repair advances, and then conclude. Next slide, please. So my main thesis is that understanding biological cell repair at the philosophical level might help in developing nanotechnology solutions that facilitate and augment biological processes congruently and geoethically with nature. Next slide. Um, so by, by way of introduction, cellular repair is an age-old function in biology. Natural cells already perform many complex acts of molecular synthesis, manipulation, repair, and replacement as part of their normal function. Philosophically, these functions reflect a systems theory perspective. Next slide. Nanotechnology, uh, the frame that I'd like to use is augmenting natural healing processes. Where nanotechnology-enabled cell repair examples could include applying synthetic growth factors and morphogens to induce tissue regeneration, the introduction of novel genetic programs for reversing cellular and tissue injuries for which natural healing mechanisms do not exist, and in the short term we might have, for example, uh, the ability to control and reverse ischemic and freezing injury, which are presently irreversible, and in the longer term, do atom by atom cellular and tissue repair. Next slide. We heard uh, Laura's frame of geoethics as healing the world, and I extend that to include um, and embrace this emerging field of geoethical behavior, which is the re research, reflection, and implementation of values and actions which support practices where human activities interact with the geosphere. Next slide. One thing that we immediately start to become aware of thinking in terms of geo timescales and geoethics is temporal asymmetries. Our planetary time has been ongoing much longer than our own human time horizon, 
and nanotechnology life cycles are something that we haven't fully defined yet. So there are different temporal uh, regimes to be aware of as we develop our geoethical technology. Next slide. Uh, so back to the agenda. Next, we'll look at uh, biological cell repair. Next slide. So in the human body, there are many different kinds of cell types. I have listed the top, I've coordinated them into six categories by function here, where there are conductive uh, cells, connective, glandular, storage, supportive, and special cells. Next slide. Um, where one of the things that we're looking to do is accelerate natural healing, um, for example, in the case following myocardial injury. So this slide talks about uh, cardiocellular repair. The three current methods that are used are replacement, rejuvenation, and regeneration. Next slide. Next slide, please. Ah, there we go. Uh, so the, the paradigm case for normal wound healing in humans is in the case of skin, where there's, uh, there are really four steps. So what happens immediately is homeostasis, which is directly after the injury, there'll be, uh, the body goes into lockdown um, to prevent blood loss and address a compromised barrier, invoking vasoconstriction where fibrin protein crosslinks at the top of the skin and to secure the border and stop the bleeding. The second uh, moment in the normal wound healing process is inflammation, which occurs over the next two to three hours, where any pathogens that have come in will be attacked and uh, vasodilation will be a process. The third uh, occurring in the next two to three days is proliferation of new cells essentially loading raw materials uh, into the site and having collagen protein in skin tissue to place uh, the fibro fibro fibroblasts that have assembled in the injury location. The fourth step is remodeling, which occurs over the days and weeks ahead, where there will be specific cell type differentiation into, uh, into new kinds of cells called the collagen is rearranged and redeposited. So overall, we notice that uh, human wound healing is cellular repair is extremely processual. There are a number of involved agents with specialized functions, and it takes place over uh, a temporality that can be as much as a few days and weeks. Next slide. So from a philosophical lens, we can say about cellular repair that some of the properties of biological cellular repair are exactly this. It's highly processual, it's globally systemic, with specialized functions and different participants with cells and growth factors. There is communication and coordination where sequentiality is a coordination mechanism and signaling is an important communication mechanism. Um, some of the presuppositions and dependencies are that there is on-demand availability of resources to call to the wound healing site. Next slide. Uh, so now let's talk about the philosophy of biological cell repair. Next slide. Next, uh, thank you. So the philosophical lens of cell repair is that I'm considering a number of philosophical topics under the umbrella of systems theory. And these include complexity, process philosophy, relational ontology, post-human transhuman philosophy, assemblage, economics, and aesthetics, all as a theoretical model for biological organization. Next slide. So first, let's look at systems theory. And this is the interdisciplinary study of the action of complex, independent of their substance, type, or spatiotemporal scale of existence, in instigating and describing principles, complexities, or systems of behavior. And biology is one of the, uh, the leading, um, uh, leading complexities which might be explained by systems theory. Next slide.
The complexity is a feature of many systems. Complexity is systems that are nonlinear, dynamic, emergent, open, unknowable at the outset, in interdependent, and self-organizing. Next slide. Post-human and transhuman perspectives is the area of philosophy that suggests uh, new ideas. For example, that hum as humans, we have always already been technological, making tools tools. Further, there is a notion that uh, the superintelligent AI debate, uh, that perhaps superintelligent AI would not take over the world, um, and that it is an outdated master-slave hierarchical paradigm to be thinking in this way. Post-human thinkings of beyond human thinking community and the sensibility that we are and are aware attending to human machines and brain computer interface interfacing creatures in the future. Next slide. Um, another systems theory um, philosophical paradigm is that of big data <clears throat> putting together complexity in machine learning, where initially uh, science and biology became a math problem. Everything we do has become a math problem and a computing problem. A second moment in this trajectory is that simple machine learning algorithms running over large data corporate start to produce results for us in terms of artificial intelligence applications and understanding and managing our world. And then the third current moment of this trajectory is the application of deep learning algorithms, uh, for example, real time image and video processing, lip reading, transcription range, is kicking us into the next higher tier of what we need to do with machine slide. So the complexity is leading into um, the area of big data analytics now, now where we're in a contemporary moment of algorithmic reality, uh, big data and machine learning analytics, where uh, we try to consider that a causal analysis in many different kinds of frameworks, including structural equation modeling, causal graphical models, and potential outcomes. And really what's happening in nearly all of these models is shifting from a simple causality mindset to a predictability of more complicated phenomenon. Next slide. So another philosophical paradigm is that of relational processes. This is the idea that relations between entities and the effects produced by the interactions are more relevant than the underlying substance, morphology, or classification. One thinker here uh, espouses relational ontology, that's uh, Karen Barad, where we might uh, replace agential realist conceptions of causality with this interconnected arc. Another idea is from process philosophy, Alfred North Whitehead, that some substance is just temporary patterns produced by processes which are more fundamental. Deleuze and Guattari discuss the idea of assemblages, and another philosopher, Adamer, discusses the idea of a fusion of horizons when we bring our different perspectives together and merge them. Next slide. So another philosophical paradigm is that of imminence. Is the, uh, that novelty comes from within, whether it's a system or an, a brain, a specific person. The new, the new model is self-determined and generated from within and extends then without. Um, so specifically in this case, I think that we've all thought of scarcity and, and abundance in a certain kind of a way where um, there's a fixed pie model for the mindset of how we see the world in a lot of cases where the maximum possibility is predetermined by the recouping of a pre-specified baseline ideal. And so we think that the maximum possible in certain situations is just to regain a certain baseline as opposed to possibility of shifting our mindset to one of abundance 
This is an expanding Pi model where we have the open-ended possibility of trajectories leading up and away from the baseline into new territory. So I think that many cases uh, would be ripe for more of an abundance mindset than a fixed pie scarcity mindset. Next slide. And particularly an abundance philosophy of economics, where we have traditionally conceived uh, all of our economic models based on scarcity, the scarce allocation of resources. Uh, but where we're headed into an automation economy and further to an actualization economy is going to require a mindset shift into that of abundant resources. Already there are many examples of uh, digital goods and social goods where the consumption of them is not tied to scarce resources and in fact may even uh, grow in the consumption. For example, social goods like fear and trust in their consumption, uh, the supply actually tends to grow. Next slide. So here in the case of cell repair, I'd like us to consider economics as an organizational paradigm where some of the new economic principles um, react to a situation where scarcity is no longer valid. We have social goods like autonomy, choice, recognition, and contribution, digital goods, where there is zero margin, marginal cost, uh, and they are infinitely popular. <laughs> examples of common such as decentralization, logical unemployment, and other economy. Next slide. So I'd like us to consider the, the proposal of a general biological economy. This is based on Bataille's idea of a general economy. Here, biological and information economies are systems based on consumption and expenditure rather than accumulation and scarcity. The principle of living matter requires that the chemical operations of life, which demand an expenditure of energy, be gainful and productive of so surpluses. Next slide. So I would like to suggest the bio-nano economy and the bio-crypto economy. This is the idea of having our medical nanorobotic uh, devices, automated, um, automated machines, coordinating cell repair. Bioeconomics and bio-crypto economics would be the model for secure automation and coordination of medical nanorobotics for geoethical cell repair in human cells. Uh, the beauty of using a blockchain-based system uh, by which the crypto economy is referring to is that there could be secure crypto transaction tracking of all of the activity of the body and also automated coordination. The logic is that medical nanorobotics is a coming on board repair platform for the human body that is widely anticipated. We would want to be tracking, coordinating, and monitoring the activity. This is a situation with a high number of agents and number of transactions where automation is an obvious requirement and a crypto tracking DAC or distributed autonomous corporation blockchain based contract mechanism could be used to coordinate the medical robotic cellular repair. Next slide. So taking the paradigm a little bit further to the future, uh, there's the idea of digital crypto citizen uh, using bio nano repair DACs. Again, these are distributed autonomous corporations that might be uh, used in the body. This is for in-cell repair DACs that would be monitoring individual cell health, facilitating augmentation. Bio DACs manage physical health and performance as a demurrage or action, action inciting health currency. The sensibility of the digital, digital crypto biocitizen could emerge such that there is a design of personal economic systems. We can all design our own. Um, we would want to be servicing our onboard cellular repair DAC nanorobots. It's sort of the idea of a quantified self plus, a greater stance of self-authority taking, 
self-care and self-maintenance. There could be longevity DAC bots connecting to our brain-computer interfaces to record memories and augment social goods in a quality of life uh, in a quality of life model. Next slide. Uh, then the final philosophical idea I wanted to look at is aesthetics as an organizational paradigm where form and content are integrated. There's a symmetry, a well-formedness, an integrity, and a functionality of form and content together. Where, for example, we could look to Kant, who talked about aesthetic judgment in two modes, a directive judgment where we recognize a new kind of particular in a class of universal that we recognize, and reflective judgment, which is an encounter with a new concept, a new particular that also belongs to a new universal, which prompts our noticing, reflecting, and naming. Next slide. So in summary, the points we get for nanotechnology design uh, from this philosophical look include complexity as nonlinear systems, post-human multi-species geo-awareness, a relational idea of a notion connecting entities, economics as a coordination paradigm, and aesthetics as an integrated form of design and uh, function. Next slide. So now turning to see these principles in action in the top nine nanotech cell repair advances. Next slide. I've enumerated the science cases of uh, some recent nanotechnology cell repair advances, um, and I have a slide on each one. The different areas are blood clot resolution, microneedle array delivery, hydrogel cellular delivery, positional nanoassembly robotics, nanotechnology guided neural regeneration, DNA nanobots in the first human trial, graphene electrode neuron interfaces, uh, nanobots cargo delivery in mice, and aged skin expression repair with broadband lasers. Next slide. So the first uh, nanotech cell repair example is blood clot dissolution, where the problem is dissolving life-threatening blood clots in the case of stroke. In this case, there was a novel nanotherapeutic for clearing the obstructed blood vessels, a biodegradable nanoparticle aggregate coated with a tissue plasminogen activator. Next slide. Um, it's a novel approach for vascular blockages where there is no blood flow. The nanotherapeutic reacts to fluid shear force, releasing TPA-coated nanoparticles. In the application it is having a less invasive alternative to the existing method, which is stents. Next slide. The second method of nanotech cellular repair is microneedle array delivery. Here the problem is having a less inv invasive diagnostic or delivery system, where instead an implantable microneedle array mimics the normal erect granulations surrounding the brain and spinal cord. The microfabricated granulations puncture through dura matter membrane in the brain to provide a conduit for cere cerebral spinal fluid flow. The application would be treating hydrocephalus and other, and other uh, cerebral spinal fluid applications. Next slide. The third application is hydrogel cellular delivery. In this case, the problem is selective permeability of the hydrogel-coated lipid bilayer. The solution is artificially engineered protein hydrogels, where the microchannel hydrogel scaffolding has the ability to control spatial organization of biomolecules in a 3D matrix. This is for improved uh, delivery. The application is selective uh, biomolecular transport and molecular separation. Next slide. Fourth application is having a molecular robot for positional nanoassembly within the body. The problem is small molecule transport and assembly, where an artificial robotic arm transports molecular cargo by inducing conformational and configurational changes. 
The application is to reposition single mo molecules in situ. Next slide. The fifth nanotech repair solution is nanotechnology guided neural regeneration. Here, the problem is directing neural stem cell differentiation into neurons and oligodendrocytes. The solution is a nanoparticle based system to deliver nanomolecules to the microenvironment to modulate cell surface chemistry. The nano scaffolds enhance gene delivery and facilitate axonal arrangement. The application is to regenerate damaged nerve tissue. Next slide. The sixth nanotech cellular repair strategy is that DNA nanobots are entering the first human trial. The problem is having a targeted cancer treatment that's less destructive than uh, chemotherapy and radiation. The solution is DNA nanobots, a single strand DNA folded into clamsh a clamshell shaped box. The clamshell contains uh, existing cancer drugs and has two states. It is closed during the targeted transport to the delivery site and then opens to disgorge the cancer cells to expose cancerous cells. The application is targeted drug delivery. Next slide. The next application is graphene electrode neuron interfaces. Here the problem is effective implantable electrode materials to interface with human neurons. The solution is creating direct graphene to neuron interfaces where neurons are, retain, are retaining their signal properties. This has been tested in rat brain cultures. The benefit is improvement over currently implanted electrodes, which are tungsten and silicon, and leave scar tissue and high, have high disconnection rates. Pure graphene is much more flexible and non-toxic. The application is restoring lost sensory function. Next slide. This nanotech cellular repair strategy involves nanobots uh, delivering cargo directly in a live mouse. The problem is having a wider range of targeted in vivo de delivery methods. And here the solution is nano robot micromotors delivering medical payload to living creature stomach tissue. Zinc-coated synthetic micromotors use stomach acid-driven propulsion to install themselves in the stomach wall. Micromotor bodies dissolved into gastric acid, releasing cargo, and left nothing toxic behind. The application was autonomous, uh, is autonomous delivery and release of therapeutic payloads in vivo and cellular manipulation. Next slide. This last application concerns the rejuvenation of aged skin gene expression. The problem is a re rejuvenation of aged skin. The solution is reju rejuvenation of skin expression patterns of aged human skin by pro broadband light treatment. The result was an improvement in fine and coarse wrinkles, abnormal pigmentation, and longevity. The application is to restore gene expression patterns of in uh, photo aged and intrinsically aged human skin to resemble younger skin. Next slide. So overall, my thesis has been that understanding biological cellular repair at the philosophical level might help in developing nanotechnology solutions that facilitate and augment biological processes congruently and geoethically with nature. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, since we don't have that large an in-house uh, um, audience, uh, we do have the possibility of taking audio questions or leave the questions to the text box. Um, the first question I would like to ask is, uh, Melanie, is there a timeline that you formulated or, or a guesstimate to a timeline in regards to the nanotech solutions that you mentioned? 
Yeah, the, um, the nine different solutions I mentioned are already uh, being developed in the lab and being tested. Some of them are in human tests already. So I think it's uh, within a 10-year time frame, some of the very specific uh, nanotech cellular repair technologies that I mentioned. With regard to um, benefits, or, or to benefits that are that are hoped for or aimed at, um, do you see any short or long term issues, say with mechanical cellular repair? Mm, in regard to uh, geoethics, well, I guess it, since you're talking in terms of say. Um, uh, medically and the um, uh, delivery of a specific amount of medication and the method, like even something like LASIKs, when that came out, LASIK surgery to correct uh, vision, there were no long-term projected uh, issues because it was something done so new, you know, so, um, so say they, there was no consideration in terms of uh, scar tissue buildup uh, 20 years later. So, is there anything that's projected that might become an issue um, with, say, medicinal delivery? Uh -huh. I think I think there are two classes of uh, potential results: uh, the ones the the risks that we foresee and the ones that we don't, and uh, unknown unknowns. And so, the, I think the the way we're dealing with this is. Um, the agenda so far has been to move very slowly and to try to design nanotechnology that may be as biodecomposable as possible, uh, exactly because we aren't sure of the long-term effects. Um, so I think we're, um, we're the technology design process is being uh, quite conservative in development and rollout. Uh, which leads to us perhaps being disappointed in uh, why are there not more nanotechnology solutions rolling out more quickly. And uh, part of it is our conservatism about the long-term effects. Valkyrie Ice did uh, lay something to the chat bot if you want to read that. Yeah. So uh, Valkyrie mentions that these are known issues um, that people have been discussing for years. And the idea of using nanobots to physically repair the basic structure of the cell. Um, so yes, I think it's exciting that we're finally starting to, well, number one, um, cell operations are a highly complicated and uh, complex process. So we, uh, a lack of understanding the biology has been one barrier to solving these problems more quickly. And then number two, having the nanotechnology. So I was very encouraged to see the, the David Lee lab in one of the solutions I mentioned, having a positional nano assembly unit for in-cell activity. Um, so both our understanding and our tools are advancing such that things that seem clear, like yes, let's repair the basic structure of the cell, it seems fairly straightforward. But the actual actually carrying that out has been uh, elusive to us because of the scale and complexity. So we have a question from Eskatoon. Um, how about brain-based nanobots as a strategy for mind uploading? Yeah, I think that's extremely um, extremely compelling. So that we have exactly the many if we have cellular repair nano robots, they may have a multiplicity of functions. And certainly all of the pathology resolution is first step and life extension, anti-aging, health span enhancement. And then number two, many other operational activities like recording memories, mind uploading, working in concert over uh, brain computer interfacing networks to uh, augment us, allow us to join uh, cloud minds and many, many other kinds of applications that this kind of functionality would enable. There's another question. Lori's asking, will now 
nanobots be utilized more specifically for electric impulse delivery to, say, an over-underactive gland like the thyroid? And I would love to see, um, that's an interesting point, the suggestion is that perhaps onboard cellular repair nanobots might be used for a whole class of health-related activities that are more uh, regulatory archipelagos and gradients. It's not a binary sick sick or well pathology that we can directly target. And so perhaps, it's, perhaps if we have a whole uh, ecology or gradient, a flock of cellular nano repair robots on board around the thyroid, for example, it could help monitor in a more qualitative way uh, or an ingredient kind of a way, um, different kinds of endocrine and other activities. I think that's a, a great activity. So another question from Lori, how does the blood clot, let's see. I have some appreciation from Val Valkyrie. Just. How does the blood clot removing capability that was described compared to the current protocol, which must be administered within a six hour window? Yeah, that's exactly a good point. Um, if the nanobots aren't on board, well, presumably they could be administered fairly quickly and in a medical setting, and so they could be administered within a six hour window. It raises the point though of uh, to what degree are we going to have technical tactical nanobots deploy, de deployed for special purposes as opposed to an onboard monitoring system, which we would also be wanting to prevent uh, blood clotting and other uh, ischemic events. Um, so I can, see, I can see both, and I can see that nanobots might become a regular uh, standard health protocol in clinical situations quite easily. So Valkyrie adds that um, these ideas fall into a predictive track and wonders perhaps about nanotech and the possibility uh, how, how can nanotech uh, relate with bodies already having outsourced your body to second life. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I think we'll just have a multiplicity of identity and possibilities more generally for corporeal embodiment and other uh, other uh, modes of um, invoking our personal identity and collaborating with others. So it makes sense that um, uh, yeah, so maybe maybe that that would be the measure of success is when we see nanobots deployed for our virtual bodies in Second Life, they become such a trope in the physical world that we see them reenacted in the virtual world. Uh, so Lori has a question about strokes. Uh, uh, Freitas's respirocytes is being cited, but before that, Lori has a question about the stroke protocol used. It used to be uh, able to be delivered by M's quickly, uh, but were removed. Uh, but they removed that from what M's can do and must now be delivered by a physician, which is an elongated, elongated how quickly they can be administered. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think uh, one of the issues that these kinds of self-monitoring nanobots raises is the role of medical professionals and often the impulse of the American Medical Association lobby is to uh, paternalistically control everything about health and including uh, the right to have one's own genetic information, to possess my own genomic information or my own biomic, microbiomic information. And I think um, Hopefully, negotiations, there'll be more negotiated autonomy uh, from the medical industry uh, by quantitative self-empowered individuals to self-monitor these kinds of activities um, because, indeed, it makes little sense to have solutions if they can't be administered effectively by the existing healthcare care system. Uh, Valkyrie was talking about 
some recent reports of oxygen supply material for blood transfusions, uh, like Freitas's respirocytes idea. And I think that's, um, I haven't seen that, the, I haven't read the underlying papers, but it's, it's exciting to see more and more possible technologies tracking into ideas that we've seen for a long time, outlined in Robert Freitas's um, <clears throat> nanorobotics visionary textbooks. Interestingly, I think a couple of uh, industries that are driving some of the, uh, the progress of nanorobotics is areas like medical tourism and aesthetic uh, medical operations, which are starting to use all kinds of ideas like the um, uh, stem cells in interesting ways and more exploratory, more quickly moving procedures being implemented. Ah, what would the nano, what would the material, what material would the proposed nano robots be made from? Uh, I think morphological freedom, agreed. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if there is any new proposal on what the proposed nanobots would be made from. I think they, I don't have a cogent answer on that. Uh, the research I've seen has some nanobots being, uh, some nanorobotic solutions being developed uh, that are uh, quickly, that are very ephemeral, have a quick degrade cycle, and others, um, I think it's more a case of relying on um, the materials that would be most useful functionally for the drug delivery, for example. Morphological freedom. Yes. Yeah, so that's what interesting this um, most nanobot, uh, nanorobotic solutions are thought to just be expelled in the body's normal waste clearing systems. Um, and so that was interesting, uh, but that restricts the degree to which in vivo delivery can extend, I believe. And so that's why this, the, mouse del um, the stomach delivery in mice to live tissue was important in being able to access areas through the stomach wall um, and then where the it's a, almost like a space shuttle then the delivery the first delivery um, vehicle is dissolved by the stomach acid and so these more compound solutions more complicated solutions that are allowing a greater range of reach within the body for delivery Yeah, exactly. So how, uh, this is a nice point from Lori about um, nanorobots uh, controlled by uh, electrical impulses. And so the nanorobots could just stay in the body circulating and be constructed from a material that would not be rejected by the human system. Yeah, one of the um, ideas I was representing pictorially is having um, a, say, a DAC, a distributed autonomous corporation it, within every cell that monitors operations within the cell. And then those are all coordinated by an automated uh, blockchain-based smart contract. Um, so the, the scale of organizing a large operation um, is such that it obviously needs to be automated. And there's no reason, um, given the room available in the body at that size, there couldn't be uh, a monitor, essentially a nano robot monitoring DAC within each cell. Sure. And then another idea that people have thought about for a long time is bringing connectivity on board uh, via our brain computer interface nano robots, that this would be also contain our internet connectivity and be an information delivery mechanism. So um, as Valkyrie suggests, we do want to have active working nanotech in on board in the body on a full time basis.
I think this area of nanotech is one where um, we developed some of the underlying technologies for pathology directed purposes, uh, and then we can quickly extend them to augmentation type purposes. <laughs> Yep, the DAC and the DAO. So they're exactly we're we're learning. We're rapidly prototyping all of our blockchain and uh, cryptocurrency type solutions loudly and publicly out in the world. All of these systems are out in the open, being attacked twenty four seven, and often brought down in different hacking or uh, challenged by different hacking scandals. So we're um, under the global task of learning how to do crypto open cryptographic systems. Um, so that hopefully they can be, as Eskatoon suggests, um, we want to understand how, how hacking a, a crypto system works very well, say, in a currency situation before we put it inside our body. <laughs> so Valkyrie is excited about the futures of nanobots. Hopefully they get there here soon. And we have something about Down syndrome. Um, Mary asking, thinking further, you have a gene causing narcolepsy, so perhaps a nano robot could repair that gene or take the place of a gene or similar that's missing. Um, for example, in Down syndrome, a nanobot could work on an extra chromosome. Yeah, and so one thing I already saw we have uh, in, in the medical field now is siRNA delivery. So, um, sort of either blocking RNA messages operating within cells or delivering, augmenting, and uh, or delivering other messages, in, uh, delivering RNA messages within cells. So absolutely, nanobots could help direct that or even um, assess and make on the spot needed RNA transcripts to manage situations. So I see uh, nanorobots as having more autonomy and volition uh, almost like drones in a sort of a sense that they would be enabled for certain autonomous operations within a certain scope within cells in the body. Uh, Valkyrie is also uh, not having faith in crypto yet. <laughs> but um, yeah, so the, the reason that I like the idea of the bio crypto economy is. Um, deploying economics as an organizational paradigm for a very large scale activity. And certainly in the body we need some sort of tracking mechanism for all of these activities that autonomous nanobots might have. And so for me, um, uh, technologies like decentralized blockchain technology is an example of a singularity class technology that might enable us to take on very large scale projects like coordinating a nanobot swarm within the body, which we haven't been able to take up previously, this level of complication of projects. And I think that's um, the, uh, the point about every crypto system being broken uh, points to the lockstep evolution of new systems. So we come out with a technology, uh, we break it, we improve it, we break that. So there's very much a, a progressive, iterating uh, design while operating, ongoing um, improvement that's connoted exactly by systems theory. It's a, it's a moving bogey that, um, that we create uh, we, that, that has different nested levels of development. So people are arguing over, uh, discussing and arguing over the benefits or detriments of crypto economies. Really suggesting there's uh, the dual use argument of technology. Um, there's any good use may be accompanied by an evil use and also pointing out an economic point about the law of un unintended consequences, externalities and other. So certainly any kind of responsible technology design would, uh, would include a broad vision of its positive uses, its negative uses, um, what might arise that's unintended. 
I think my general sense on all of this is to try to exactly that some problems can be foreseen and some cannot, and to proceed, uh, proceed not to be paralyzed in not proceeding at all because the in a complex system, not everything could ever be known at the outset, but not to be paralyzed by that, but rather to very much have an active thinking approach, see what's happening, go forward in a positive yeah, so Lori is saying this is exactly some of the, the purpose of this venue, this uh, 11th annual venue of the Geo et, et al. workshop here, is to discuss these kinds of things. That there can be negativity and different kinds of preemptive regulation that might be harmful to, to technology that technology, science and technology always proceeds and then law uh, runs to catch up. Also social maturity runs to catch up afterward um, as we continue to make science fiction uh, into science fact. So uh, Lori is wondering whose realm of expertise would be would it be regarding biocryptology? In regard to I'm, a, I'm guessing that's in terms of regulation. Um, there's no real regulatory entity. Um, um, there, yeah, even the concept. Uh, let's see. Uh, Valkyrie is inter interjecting something. So I think on the, the idea of biocryptology, th this is a completely new field that's very exciting um, as far as I'm concerned. And so let's see. So in terms of expertise, this is definitely an example of system theoretic complexity where it's an interdisciplinary kind of problem. So for biocryptology, you would want bio people, the life scientists, um, and crypt cryptographic mathematicians and to even understand there may be uh, you know DNA is actually an example of an um, it stays stored in the nucleus and transcripts come out in the RNA but DNA itself is an example of biocryptology the cilia for example has a triple encryption mechanism which has lived uh, longer um, and it has a topological form to its DNA that's the first level, and then it's uh, in, in, a, encapsulated in a nucleus, and then um, another mechanism. So it's, it's got, uh, you know, it's running SHA-3, and us humans are running SHA-2, if, um, if there were to be a metaphor. Um, so, so number one, I think it's interesting, what, what is biocryptology already? What are some examples in biology? Uh, number, but number two, how could we interpret cryptographic principles in the biological setting? That's what we're talking about. And then in my, in my conjecture, using nanotechnology, nanorobots, in fact, to do that. So um, cryptology is absolutely a technology, a contemporary technology of the moment that is advancing. And so what could that mean? How can we deploy that in a bio context in a helpful way? Particularly, and I'm hopeful because um, these, these biological examples require such scale and automation and coordination and tracking um, that it suggests that, that these new blockchain-based cryptographic models could be a very interesting idea particularly with the economic principles that I discussed as an organization mechanism, and uh, therefore the, the bio-crypto economy. So Valkyrie says um, that uh, has, had been, has been described as an anti-privacy activist. Uh, because because uh, after reporting on the advance of transparency, 
Uh, so sounding like a little bit sad, not having been received the way uh, that might have wanted to be, but yet pointing out issues about privacy and transparency. Uh, Lori wonders who are these that might be formulating the biocryptology. Uh, I think I think it's a brand new industry. Um, I think we put a hackerspace and a bio lab together. It's a new kind of concept. Um, so, for example, I just suggested at the upcoming Ethereum hackathon to do a bio nano DAC, exactly like I proposed in this talk, a cell monitoring. Um, distributed autonomous corporation, this blockchain base that could conduct s some certain operations within the body. Uh, Lori also points out that an interesting video was posted today to social networks um, about new technology leading the human race. So that looks to something interesting to check. Yeah, that definitely interdisciplinarity. So a bio if you were to really deploy bio nanotech, so you'd want, you know, you sort of want Vitalik Buterin from Ethereum, Robert Freitas Jr., and I don't know, Craig Venture in a room. <laughs> and if you if you got those three tackled on a problem of bio crypto economy and uh, um, these kinds of ideas. Uh, for biocryptology, that, that's probably a good start of the kinds of uh, the kinds of mindsets uh, and skills that could be contributive to this new field of biocryptology. Maybe we can have a workshop on that next time, or invite papers. I would be happy to write a CFP exactly on that for a TerraSAM journal issue. So um, Eskatun was um, acknowledged for, for posting, for citing this video about Brave New Horizon, where will technology lead the human race? Future workshop names, always welcome. <laughs> So Valkyrie is disappointed more people weren't here for our di dialogue today. As asynchronous temporalities, people, uh, I don't know, maybe people don't like to participate in live events as much anymore. Everybody's busy, wants to consume things on their own schedule. There were a number of um, views of the slides already, and I, I didn't even post them to my own. Uh, social networks yet. I really like the idea of developing this biocryptography, and this biocryptology, because the other the other feature I like about cryptography is that in the body we want um, we want some sort of secure and trackable system, and potentially also related to liability. So the moment. Uh, just as Craig Venture is um, is signing any synthetic DNA creations uh, with additional base pair codings, uh, exactly, we'll need some sort of a liability tracking mechanism for pharmaceutical company deployed nanobots within the body, and the obvious tracking, large scale tracking me mechanism right now is blockchains. Um, so these these uh, body chains, you could have body blockchains that track all of this. That could also uh, relate, as Eskatoon mentioned, to our life logging, to brain computer interfaces that record, uh, uh, facilitate our mind upload and our memory recording functions. We would want a security dimension to that as well. And so the just the sheer scale of number of transactions that nanobots will need to be doing that we want tracked, that we want automated, that we want secure, and also possibly remunerated. You can have payment channels for the amount of dopamine consumed by a, a field of neurons, for example. So a remuneration mechanism is also built into blockchains that's necessary and helpful. 
So um, it's hard to argue that blockchains, in fact, would not be the automation coordination mechanism of nanobots meets within the body. Let's see. So we have some comments. Accountability through transparency, absolutely, and trust building. So if you, so it's actually a good point that Valkyrie makes, uh, which suggests trust building in these kinds of solutions. So what would, how would I feel more trustful actually bringing a nanobot fleet on board on my in my body to do perform certain operations? And if I could look up on. Um, biocryptology blockchains for other people that have tried this solution or the drug trials for this solution that would build trust in a way that's much more transparent than our current trust building uh, mechanisms. Lori's uh, saying that the fact that biocryptology may call together several disciplines fosters a coordination that we need to help each other and ourselves, which is exactly goes to my uh, systems theory kind of a point. Um, and Valkyrie points out that hiding things is counterproductive to accountability. Lori suggests that a delivery system of very specified amounts of medication sounds like something that uh, might greatly annoy Big Pharma. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, and Valkyrie agrees. And yes, so I think, um, well, blockchain models, like crypto, cryptographic models, so it's more, um, well, pharma could still charge uh, for consumed medications in um, an uh, expropriative kind of way, in a monopolistic kind of a way. Um, but the point is, so we could have whatever economic business models surround new kinds of drug delivery solutions, but the, the interesting bio, biological point is what's a better, what's a better means of uh, what's the underlying pathology presentation and resolution and our drug mechanisms for responding to that um, being more, it's much more in the sense of uh, it's very ad hoc, uh, contextually based and variable in terms of what the biological system needs today versus yesterday or so on. So for example, in all of the chemotherapy and radiation drip treatments, the patient's body takes on different variable amounts to, depending on the day, the actual consumed amount of the drug. And so more variable, so it's sort of a crude delivery and pricing mechanism right now. And so the granularity of that uh, could be refined. And then uh, drug companies might do whatever payment models uh, they, they would like that attend to that. Um, but it, it's a different kind of idea. So. Uh, similar right now, payment channels as a consumption-based pricing model is being used in things like YouTube videos or broadband internet connectivity consumption. And so it's just a different kind of use-based pricing model related to value-based pricing. Um, it's just an, alter an alternative pricing model where um, I think it's attractive in the biological setting because exactly uh, Usage-based consumption is a variability that corresponds more congruently to how the body actually works. And some people like to annoy big pharma, some people don't. So, <laughs> which is another point point about decentralization of blockchain technology is that. Um, in one sense, it helps the establishment do whatever they're doing better. In, a, in another sense, it helps challenge the establishment. Uh, so it's really a decentralized a technology that everybody can embrace. So Valkyrie is, is wondering if Lori has read some of the articles that Valkyrie has written. Lori says, as with pacemakers, do we having a nanobot that delivers impulses within the system may be ill affected by outside devices like microwaves or magnetic fields? <clears throat> so it's, uh, so it's uh, 
I think it's a great idea to have various resident in body nanobots that perform a variety of operation, including delivering electrical impulses. And this could also be uh, used quite effectively in the brain, for example, uh, for, for electrical delivery. Um, and certainly interference is an issue, and so how um, how that's managed would be a thing, and then also would be a concern, and also hacking. So already these these pacemaker hacking schemes um, are of concern. So this is exactly that a new technology advance isn't automatically going to be doves and rainbows, and uh, but there may be risks that also need to be designed for in the process. So I don't know, I think uh, what comes to mind is the body area networking protocols at the IEEE, their working group on that. And so perhaps uh, different bandwidth ranges are assigned for certain kinds of in-body communications that specifically would be less susceptible to interference or non-interference if possible. Um, or diff different uses, maybe there's a multiplexer um, that, trans that um, encrypted signals are used also within the body so that there, there couldn't, the heart wouldn't receive um, a signal unless it was a bona fide uh, signal from the nanobot as opposed to some sort of hacking or interference signal. Um, yeah, it's another area where it's interdisciplinary between the biology and the signal trans uh, with communications networks, signal transmission, uh, possibly microarrays, and it occurs to me, and then philosophy as well. We'd want to use Shannon's information theory to understand, um, to inform the system's signaling protocols. So Lori encourages Valkyrie to provide article links. Yeah, Shannon's information theory, famous Bell Labs. Um, one interesting thing about Shannon's information theory, I'm, uh, I'm trying to think, um, that information has properties that it's, that it, uh, information is discrete, simultaneously some discrete and continuous. Um, it's an interesting property of information. It's a quite a malleable thing in his calculations. Uh, which is, is sort of interesting that's related to how we see light. Um, it's both uh, discrete and continuous. It's until it's collapsed into an observation, light is a particle and a wave. And I've been trying to make a similar argument with time. Time in a raw material state is, could, is both discrete and continuous, and it may collapse into a reality instance of one or the other. Um, uh, but, it, but interesting that uh, cosmological physicists looking at the Planck scale have a view that the physical world is composable. Uh, time and space um, are like Lego bricks um, that at the Planck scale, very, very small, are, uh, the physical universe is composable. So that's very much our positional nanotechnology idea as well, that at the atomic level, material is composable. Um, so 
at the Planck scale. Also, uh, our material world is composable, and from Shannon information theory, also information is composable. It's simultaneously discrete and continuous. It's quite malleable. It has properties that we can work with and compose. I'm just answering the last few Q&A, so feel free to stay here. I'm just going to a conference with uh, where Julian Barber is sometimes there. Um, yeah, and there are very other interesting things. Lee Smolin's recent book conjecturing that math, uh, that time precedes math um, in its uh, existence in the universe. Uh, Valkyrie says, at its base, I see the universe as patterned energy fields. Yes, exactly. Scale is all about scale. And as Katoon mentions, exactly me reading The End of Time by Julian Barber. Fascinating. Although Julian Barber has an interesting... He thinks the uh, time arrow is reversible in a paper, and it's supported by an Italian physicist uh, where, where some more details of this reasoning are available. And, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not uh, – I'm, it's sort of an interesting theory because we, we have just accepted for so long that, that we have an irreversible – time arrow. Time, in fact, time has been just accept, accepted as an unmalleable property um, in our existence. So Valkyrie uh, mentioned several times the benefits of, a, of an SL virtual body for physical embodiment. And uh, time is something also that that's the biggest post-human thing we could do is try to make more time. And I think that, uh, in fact, there are many ways that we can and do make more time. And, for example, we get a sense of having more time if we are able to access other event trajectories. So even, if, even looking at Facebook, for example, you see other event trajectories lived by others that you yourself did not live. And so already there's a sense of um, more time through accessing alternative event trajectories. And I think that with the idea of block time, actually, which is a time regime of blockchains, that when we start to do our uh, mind uploading and other digital self operations, that's another mode of time multiplicity, of finally being able to have more time. Uh, through this time arbitrage, we can do between time regimes, like our human physical lift time, and our blockchain-based block time, um, compute time in general has always been an alternative time regime that's been more malleable with stop time, no time, um, event-based triggers, and not just this unilinear arrow of human live time that is our experience in the physical world. And so I exactly theories like Julian Barber's about uh, reversibility of the time arrow uh, may help with some conceptual underpinnings for that. <laughs> um, Eskatoon, so I, I have a couple of talks on my slide share about block time and making more time, um, the temporality of blockchains, that where I'm making this argument about make more time, that's, that's our objective as most humans. So, and even we could use our, our onboard nanotech robots in, in, a, in the biocryptography to manage our, our perception of time. So not only, that's another application, enhancement type application for our, now our onboard uh, brain-computer interface nanobots <clears throat> is to manage the quality of our experiences. So if it notices from our, um, our affect 
um, sensors that we're having a good experience, maybe our nanobots, in fact, slow down our time perception so we have more enjoyment. That's another way to make more time. And if our nanobots notice that effectively we are not enjoying an experience, uh, then they might speed up our perception of time parameters. So that's actually um, uh, tempor temporality could be a feature uh, in our biocryptographic nanobots. So Eskatoon would like to say more, <laughs> but is, um, doesn't have the resources since he since is also involved in recording. And Valkyrie says, multiple simultaneous instances of an individual with shared memory between clouds. Exactly. So it's so, sort of the idea of uh, cloud mind. Um, so I think exactly that we start to have more different kinds of access to collective experiences through these kinds of techniques and technologies. Wow, Melody, this is this is all fantastic um, the information that you put into your presentation. It's so thought provoking in the areas of of um, the cell repair and, and molecular synthesis and um, and just the theories put forth, even from like inception um, uh, to uh, long term uses and goals. Um, this is fascinating, and, and I've made notations as to a lot of the uh, theories that you brought to mind so that I can look further into them, e even just to expand my own questions, at the very least. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Really, I, I really enjoy participating with the TerraSM events because it um, inspires me to extend my own thinking, so I really appreciate the opportunity to do that and to share that today. Well, I, I've taken the um, advantage of being able to meet certain individuals through the terrorism workshops, even a neuroscientist, in terms of asking questions about the uh, electrical aspect of the use of nanobots uh, versus or in conjunction with a specific delivery of medicines, because we as a, a whole take a lot more medication than we need because um, a certain amount needs to be delivered to that specific area. So that's why I brought up about format and such, but a lot of people haven't considered the electrical aspect of it. So so I appreciated your conversation and, and willingness to embrace that that portion. Yeah, that's a great, great idea for use of them, in fact. Possibly even less, um, less invasive. And it won't be lying in the pockets of Big Pharma either, maybe just the local electric company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or our local QS biohacking lab. Maker, it's a maker lab project. True. Well, again, I, I would like to thank you for the time and energy um, that you put into that presentation and, and for entertaining the the varied nature of the, the questions that we that we hit you up with. A lot of them, you know, kind of come out of left field, but but then tying right in to, um, to the topic at hand. But thank you. Yeah, so I, much appreciate, I appreciate the dialogue with everybody. Thank you, everybody. Take care and follow up with me later in any way that you like.